Hey there, YouTube, and welcome to Ask a Maestro. Today's question comes from one of my former students, Cami Lee, who one time came up to me and told me that she had been listening to recordings of early music, say, from the Baroque period. And she knew that musicians who specialized in this era of music often did not use any vibrato in their playing. And she was right. Musicians who specialize in music from the Baroque and early classical eras usually do not play their instruments using vibrato. And so she asked, what's the deal with that? What is the deal with that? It's a good question because young musicians, string players especially, have to work to cultivate their vibrato. It's something that they aspire to, to give their sound a certain identity and warmth and richness. In string playing, this is achieved by a gentle fluctuation of the finger on the fingerboard, which produces a gentle oscillation in pitch and we tend to think gives the note more liveliness and warmth. Singers come by vibrato very naturally. Here is the difference between a note sung without vibrato, la, and one sung with vibrato, la. It's something that comes rather naturally to singers. So why do these certain musicians and scholars and specialists assume that prior to the year 1800 or the year 1750, vibrato was simply not used. Well, of course, it is impossible for us to know what music sounded like prior to the advent of recording technology. And even listening to music in the first few decades of sound recording, we can't get a very detailed picture of what's going on. So what we have to do is turn to written accounts from listeners and documentation from people who taught and theorized about how to make music to get some idea of how they were actually playing and performing music. Now, most people's favorite source about music making in the 18th century is Leopold Mozart's Violinschule. And of course, we would think Leopold Mozart must have pretty excellent bona fides since he taught his son, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and obviously his son turned out okay as far as music was concerned. So the quote that everybody likes to turn to from this treatise says the following. There are performers who tremble consistently on each note as if they had the permanent fever. The tremolo or vibrato must only be used at places where nature herself would produce it. And he goes on to say that intelligent performers and clever singers will use vibrato to ornament the final note of a melody or a phrase, especially if that is a long note. So from this, people have sort of extrapolated, well, if the vibrato is used as an ornament, as an embellishment, then it must not have been used on the other notes, the notes that weren't at the end of a phrase or particularly long. And many people are content to stop right there, but it doesn't take much digging to find contradictory evidence, even in the same treatise. All we have to do is turn to the chapter about producing tone, which mainly focuses on bowing techniques, but also has this to say about the left hand. The left hand finger should make a small slow movement, which, however, must not go toward the slide, but forward and backward. That is, the finger should bend forward toward the bridge and backward towards the scroll, quite slowly for soft tones, but somewhat faster for loud ones. So a gentle oscillation of the finger on the fingerboard is basically the definition of vibrato. And here is Leopold Mozart saying that it should be used as a regular feature of one's playing. So is Mozart disagreeing with himself here? Not necessarily, because there are many types of vibrato. There is a basic type of vibrato that most string players use to get a little bit more ring out of their instruments, and then there is a more ornamental vibrato that might be used to color or flavor a certain note in a phrase. You know, Frank Sinatra even did this. I get a kick out of you. But of course, Leopold Mozart is not the only source that we have from the 18th and 19th and 17th centuries, there is a treatise by the famous violinist and teacher Francesco Gemignani, who studied under Domenico Scarlatti, one of the famous composers of music history, and worked with no one less than George Frederick Handel. And he wrote, right around the same time as Mozart's treatise, the vibrato makes the sound more agreeable. I use it as much as possible. As far back as the year 1687, we have the Traité de la Viol, the treatise on the viol, written by Jean Rousseau, who recommends two types of vibrato, one with a single finger, one with two fingers, and says that these should be used to imitate the sound of the human voice. Now, of course, I'm picking and choosing sort of pro-vibrato references here, but you can find plenty of sources that say that you should not use vibrato, or that you should use less vibrato, or that vibrato was a matter of taste and refinement and had to be used discriminately. And who can argue with that? But it could not be further from the truth 
to say that there was a non-vibrato era and then all of a sudden there was a vibrato era. The sources just don't bear this out. Musicians then were as they are now, very opinionated people with different tastes and different regional traditions. And goodness gracious are people opinionated, especially now when it comes to this subject. There is a whole thing called vibrato wars and it's been waged over the past nearly 40 years, mainly by the music directors of a number of early music groups, who seem to want to establish a unique style of playing based on a few sources and a few chosen quotes. And I don't begrudge them this. I think that the early music, or what's called hip, historically informed performance, has given us fresh ears for early music. They have been re responsible for reconstructing instruments from earlier eras, bringing in new ideas about intonation and rhythmic styles and ensemble performance practices. But each musician is going to choose to focus on a few ideas that they have learned from a few documents. You simply can't account for the scope of everything that was written about music performance and theory in an earlier era. Now there is some good evidence to suggest that less vibrato was used overall prior to the mid-1800s. Part of this comes from the design of the instruments themselves. For example, violins did not have chin rests regularly until about that era. Same thing with cellos and the end pin. And without these bits of technological hardware, it's sort of hard to give your hand the freedom to vibrate all the time. There's really only one period in history that has seen a total 180 shift about the use of vibrato. And that's our own time. Because at this point, the trend away from using vibrato in music from before 1750 or so has really taken full force. And what's happened in about the last 10 to 15 years is that these claims about a certain type of vibrato-less sound have crept into music from later and later time periods. The most vocal proponent of divesting ourselves from vibrato has got to be the English conductor Sir Roger Norrington. In 2003, Norrington wrote an op-ed in the New York Times claiming that vibrato was not regularly used in orchestras until the years 1920 or 1930 when Berlioz and Schumann, Brahms and Wagner, Bruckner and Mahler, Schoenberg and Baird were composing their masterpieces, there was only one orchestral sound, a warm, expressive, pure tone, without the glamorized vibrato we are used to. Well, I contest this very basic thesis of his right off the bat. You cannot claim that there has been only one orchestral sound in the history of music. You're telling me that with all of these different traditions and teachers and opinions and tastes, not one person in an orchestra was vibrating on their instrument before 1920? He goes on. The great Austrian violinist Fritz Kreisler seems to have started the fashion, drawing on the style of cafe musicians and Hungarian and gypsy fiddlers. And here's where we get to what I would consider some very problematic racial language. This idea that the pure Western and Northern Europeans were playing with pure tone this whole time, and then fiddlers from these swarthy races playing in down-and-out cafes started to infect the rest of Europe with their playing style. I mean, it's, it's a little bit gross, quite honestly. In the 1920s, the more sensuous and entertainment-minded French players began to experiment with continuous vibrato, and the British followed suit in the late 1920s. But the high-minded Germans and most of the big American institutions held out until the 1930s. This idea is so silly that we can say that all of a sudden one country started experimenting with a, a new style of playing. That you would have these lusty Frenchmen sitting at the Moulin Rouge watching the girls do their can-can kicks, saying like, Oh, ha, ha, ha. I am not honey enough. We must have more vibrato in the violins. I'm sorry, at best, Mr. Norrington, these are alternative facts. Because we do have documentation, both audio and visual, that showed that orchestras prior to the 1930s, even in high-minded Germany, were using vibrato sort of catch as catch can. Some of the musicians did, some of the musicians didn't. So I don't know, vibrato is something that will continue to bedevil us all, and really there is no one solution to this. We have to use our tastes and our listening and our research and make our own decisions about what we think sounds musical to our own ears. Okay, YouTube, that is it for this screed on vibrato. There is much, much more to be said about this. I will put some resources to really great in-depth research in the description box below. Thank you so much to Cami for asking this question. The rest of you, please leave your questions about classical music in the comments below. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, go play an instrument or sing a song. And until then, goodbye, everyone.